Yep. Live, I see a spinning. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Erica Ferriston. Welcome to Healthcare for All Los Angeles Speaker Series. So excited tonight to have Dr. Paul Song with us and uh, Jeannie Simpson. So um, I am the director of Healthcare for All Los Angeles, along with Maureen Cruz. Maureen, if you want to wave and co-chair of Healthcare for All Los Angeles, along with Betty Dumas Toto. Betty, if you wanna give a wave so everybody knows who you are. Um, and so um, Healthcare for All Los Angeles is a local chapter of Healthcare for All California, a statewide organization dedicated to achieving a comprehensive universal healthcare system through single payer public financing. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement that um, I borrowed from White People for Black Lives. Um, I did get their permission. Um, great organization if you wanna check it out. And so we acknowledge the Tongva peoples as the traditional caretakers of the land we currently reside on. That is the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern Channel Islands. We seek to honor the land and the courageous people who have been its stewards, modeling a tradition of resistance, seeking liberation. We pay our respects to ancestors, elders, and relations past, present, and emerging. And if you are outside the greater Los Angeles area, welcome. So glad you're tuning in. You can find out whose land you are on by going to native-land.ca. All right. And tonight we are talking about why the public option is no option. Um, and we have with us Dr. Paul Song. Um, Dr. Song is the president of Physicians for a National Health Program, California, and was a national surrogate for the 2016 and 2020 Bernie Sanders campaign. He served as the very first visiting fellow on healthcare policy in the California Department of Insurance in 2013. Along with serving on the National Board of Physicians for a National Health Program, he also serves on Center for Health and Democracy and Progressive Democrats of America. And with that, Dr. Paul Song, take it away. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. And I just want to thank all of you guys for your continued work and for being sort of the consciousness of our entire state and beyond um, and just holding everyone's feet to the fire, including mine. So thank you very much. Um, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and, and start. And again, I'll make these slides available to any of you who want them. Um, really, I think what happened was lately we had seen some people running for office here in California and beyond who um, we had thought were staunch single payer supporters, only to say that they uh, would very much support a public option. And I think it got a lot of us thinking, did the really people know what was so harmful about advocating for that? And so I wanted to really, again, reiterate what um, is wrong with our broken healthcare system and why a public option really simply doesn't address that. So this is a picture of President Obama signing the Affordable Care Act into law in March of 2010. It's hard to believe it's been over 11 years now. And in some way it's affected all of us one way or another. Uh, some people on this call may have uh, qualified uh, for Medicaid under the expansion. Uh, some people who are on Medicare may have gotten uh, more coverage for Part D or their drug uh, prescription drugs. Uh, some of you may um, have gotten a subsidy to purchase coverage under exchange, or some of you may have been covered uh, with uh, because you had reached your lifetime cap uh, or were excluded because of pre-existing conditions. So the Affordable Care Act did do a lot of good things. But as we all know, it, it's woefully incomplete. Uh, and just to show you that in the run up to the Affordable Care Act, The Lancet, which is a highly reputable medical journal, dedicated one full issue to why we couldn't get health care right in the United States. And it said the health care reform process exposes how corporate influence renders the U.S. government incapable of making policy on the basis of evidence and the public interest. And 
essentially there were 3,300 registered healthcare lobbyists for the 535 members of Congress. They were spending more than $1.2 million a day. And in total, more was spent lobbying Congress than was spent on the entire Bush Kerry presidential election. And as a result, we have no public option. We have no insurance rate regulation or drug pricing control. And if you look at what's really ailing uh, our, our uh, current Affordable Care Act, the things that people complain about are runaway drug prices, runaway insurance rates, and uh, well, the public option, we can argue about that. Um, so a couple things, as you all know on the left, is that we spend more as a part of our gross domestic product on uh, healthcare than any of the other industrialized nations, and yet we have a life expectancy of about four years less than most of these other countries. But if you look on the right, if you see again how much we spend per capita, but then if you look at the number of people that are facing financial harm, uh, it's really uh, kind of staggering, right? You would think given that we spend twice as much, maybe all of us would have half the financial risk, but we actually, uh, it's not the case at all. And um, for many of you who uh, are part of the employer sponsored um, uh, solution that so many corporate Dems have been touting forever, just to show you that this is pre-COVID, that not only have you been asked to contribute more of your paycheck every month towards your premiums, maybe when you started at your job six or seven years ago, they didn't take out any part of your salary for that, but now you're being asked to contribute more as a percentage. You can see that's gone up every year. Uh, and then on the back end, if you get sick, you're being asked to contribute more in terms of co-pays and deductibles on the back end. And as a result, most workers have far less take-home pay now than they've had before. And uh, family premiums and inflation have continued to rise, whereas our wages have remained stagnant. <clears throat> and, and the other thing I'll just say about that is pre-COVID, many of you maybe were stuck in a job you hated strictly because of the healthcare benefits. So um, uh, this whole idea of employer-sponsored healthcare, which we'll show you, which was really exposed by the COVID uh, situation, uh, it was really not doing any of us favors uh, up to this, but yet you had people like Senator Klobuchar and others just touting it as the way that we needed to continue to move forward in this country. Uh, and then this is just from 2015, 2017. If you look on the left, the number of people that reported that their monthly premium was more difficult for them to pay, the number of people that reported the co-pays for doctor visits was getting more difficult for them to pay, and then the number of people that reported their deductibles uh, were, were much more difficult for them to pay each year. You can see that the Affordable Care Act has been anything but affordable for so many of us. Uh, and then the other part that people um, uh, uh, make a mistake of is equating that the insurance card that you have, uh, they equate it with access to care. And you can see up above in terms of when asked how many people with insurance delayed seeking care because they couldn't afford the co-pays or deductibles, um, you can see that it's roughly one out of three people that, that is delayed seeking care. And down below, you can see that it has a disproportionate effect on uh, communities of color. So I've always said this, having an insurance card doesn't mean anything. Uh, it doesn't mean you, you're actually gonna be able to go see a doctor because if you don't have the funds to back it up, and particularly in the first part of the year when you haven't used your deductible up and you have to basically pay for almost everything out of your pocket, many of you uh, or us may delay seeking care. Uh, and let's not forget because we did not put in any prescription drug pricing controls that in 2017, 45 million Americans reported that they did not fill a prescription due to costs and that roughly one out of five seniors does not uh, fill a prescription because again of costs. Uh, and then the other thing is the idea of narrow networks. So what we mean by narrow networks or some of you may have an insurance, private insurance and a narrow network means that they're only contracted with 25% of the uh, providers in your given area. So when they hear, while well, you're gonna kick people off uh, from seeing their doctors, the private insurance industry already does that. Chances are that when you go through that directory of all the choices you have of special doctors that you wanna see, uh, that 75% of the doctors, you, know, you can't go see them right now. So again, this is another myth that we need to be aware of that it's already uh, a lack of choice that we have in our current for-profit system. So this is our complicated system, right? Some of you maybe had United Healthcare a few years ago, then you changed jobs or you lost your job and maybe you were put into Medicaid 
or maybe your job, your employer then switched to an HMO, um, maybe it was uh, Aetna, then the next year is Blue Cross. And then when you go to a doctor or a hospital, they've got to figure out, well, am I still in your network? What's your copay? What's your deductible? And rather than actually spending time taking care of you, they're spending a lot more money hiring staff to basically sort out this mess of a complicated system. And if you look above from 1970 to 2015, this shows you the growth in the number of physicians, which is the green line. But if you look above the growth in terms of case uh, uh, managers, um, administrators for uh, the uh, administration of our healthcare system, it's exploded. And down below, if you look at the curves, what do you see that in 19, roughly 90, when you saw this explosion of healthcare administrators, it was also coincided with the privatization of Medicare, as well as it caused a much higher increase in the cost of private insurance and out-of-pocket costs. So as a result, we actually spend more of our administrative budget uh, of, of every dollar that's spent on healthcare than any other industrialized nation. And so we're very inefficient for this. And, and it's gotten so bad that hospitals like Duke University actually have more uh, medical billing clerks than they do hospital beds to deal with all of the complexity of our healthcare system. And again, these are, instead of uh, adding more ICU beds or improving the infrastructure of the hospital, they're having to hire more and more people to basically fight with insurance companies to deal with claims. And it's gotten so bad that a lot of hospitals are spending roughly a quarter of their budget on administrative costs. But here's another part. Uh, United States, we, we spend so much on administrative costs, but we spend very little on long-term health care, uh, long-term health, right? So as we get an aging population, as some of you may have uh, parents who are dealing with maybe Alzheimer's now or some other chronic uh, illness and they have to get into long-term care, uh, a lot of families are having to bear the majority of the burden with somebody that's been in a long time. And this is just to show you that all of the money we're spending on administrative costs, we're spending so little uh, compared to our other industrialized nations in terms of long-term care. So one of the things we could do is if we could simplify our administrative uh, system, perhaps we'd have a lot more money to also put towards long-term care. And it's no wonder that we're considered to have one of the least efficient healthcare systems in the world. And on the right is the Bloomberg World Rankings of healthcare systems, and you can see we're not even on that list. Uh, and let's talk about Medicaid for a second, because you know when you see legislators in our state or other uh, quote uh, healthcare activist organizations in our state, uh, they never seem to advocate for Medicare for all or single payer. They just want to put more people on Medicaid, and these are actually. Um, headlines that emerged over the last six months in the LA Times. They've been doing some really great stories on how the healthcare uh, safety net, which is Medi-Cal in our state, has really failed people. So one is that it is a separate and unequal healthcare system. I would even argue it's quite racist, and I'll show you some data why. Uh, then the, recently, the uh, LA Times highlighted several people uh, that had to wait a long, long time and died actually waiting for timely care. Uh, and then particularly in the poorest neighborhoods, a lot of these patients never even get to see a specialist in that period of time. So let me show you some things. So this was uh, a study that was done um, and they found that nearly three quarters of the 73 million low uh, income Americans are on Medicaid, but they're in some managed care. And under the system, keeping patients as healthy, healthy as possible is one way to make money. The other way is to skimp on services. And what we found is with the continuous privatization of Medicaid and Medi-Cal, it's really skimped on services and reimbursement. And as a result, fewer and fewer patients really get access to the care that they need. And this is just showing you above, take three hospitals in the Los Angeles area. There's MLK, Ronald Reagan UCLA and Cedar sinai You can see that, first of all, the percent of people of color, 94% at MLK, 36% at Cedar sinai uh, you can also see that um, despite the fact that Cedar sinai has 58% uh, in their quote catchment area, or people of color, they only treat 36%. And then look down below in terms of meaningful community benefit spending, not billboards or sponsoring the LA Dodgers or all those other things, but actually taking care of uh, uncompensated care. Cedar sinai only gives a paltry 1.1%. 
uh, uh, UCLA gets 0.6%, MLK gets 5.6%. But down, down below, look at the percentage of Medicaid patients as a total share of their revenue. Cedar sign only, only 10%, and MLK 75%. So it's no wonder these hospitals, when they were faced with the pandemic of COVID, why MLK Hospital and a lot of hospitals in the uh, uh, disadvantaged communities didn't have enough ICU beds, didn't have enough equipment, ventilators, because they couldn't afford it, because they're treating all of the patients that Cedars and others refuse, and they get diverted back to these um, uh, communities of color. And then this is just showing you some uh, uh, examples of patients waiting months for care. This was an initial referral in March of 2015. Um, 16 days after the initial referral, they get the diagnostic test, but they didn't then get the actual care they needed for 234 days. And this patient ended up dying. Here's another one. Uh, this was a Vietnamese woman that uh, waited 99 days to actually see a neurosurgeon because again, so few doctors will take Medi-Cal and then 312 days after the diagnosis was able to then finally get surgery. So it's no wonder that MALDEF sued the state of California claiming that a Medi-Cal in our state was a separate and unequal system and inherently racist. It finally was able to move forward. Um, so it, they, they filed it in 2017, the state fought tooth and nail, but now a judge ruled that indeed this lawsuit can move forward. And this is something that I think is very, very impactful. But think of that when you think of the incrementalists who maybe don't want a public option, but they just want to expand Medicaid. Expand Medicaid for everyone that, except for us that have our private insurance or Medicare, and we don't really care about them. So let's look at what COVID has done to expose all of the inadequacies of our healthcare system. We just, even though the numbers are coming down, we passed over 590,000 deaths. Um, and you can look down uh, below is, uh, remember during the presidential debate where uh, uh, then Vice President Biden slammed Bernie and said, you know, look at the countries that have single payer, they have, they're, they're dying in droves. Well, look what's happened since that time. Those countries have done a good job of controlling death, whereas the United States has been an unmitigated disaster. The other part is you had Amy Klobuchar slam uh, Bernie saying, you're gonna kick 100 million people off their employer sponsored healthcare. Well, guess what? The pandemic uh, kicked off 14 million uh, and counting off their employer sponsored healthcare. And let's look at, remember who our frontline workers were, uh, uh, cooks, cashiers, waiters, waitresses, majority of them are uninsured and you're putting them in the front line, exposing them to COVID because you didn't give them proper PPE, they get sick and then they don't have the health insurance to go see a doctor and get the care that they need. They end up living in multi-generational households and they spread this infection and it's no wonder we reap what we sow as a nation. But look at how many other people lost healthcare in all of these other countries during the pandemic, zero. So we would all argue, I know on this call that healthcare is a human right, not a job perk. And um, again, this just shows you that during the uh, pandemic hospitals were actually rationing care. So you hear one of the other arguments against a single payer or socialized system is that you're gonna ration care. Well, guess what? The richest nation in the world was rationing care during the pandemic. Uh, but here's who did well during the pandemic. You know, United Health Group, Anthem, record profits, and they continue to do so. So it's no wonder that during the pandemic, um, when people asked, should the government intervene and make Medicare available to anyone who lost their health care coverage, the majority of people said yes, both in terms of 64% of uh, Democrats, but roughly, you know, uh, two thirds of the people said yes. But what did we get? We got a government bailout for the private insurance industry, basically giving anyone who lost their job, their employer, uh, lots of money to go give them COBRA, right? Instead of uh, at an inflative cost, instead of just putting everyone on Medicare. Just shows you again, our corporate uh, bought members of Congress. Um, so I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit just to, to talk a little bit now about the, um, um, the, the, the summarize the problems and show you what a public option is designed to do. So we have 31 plus million uninsured, no coverage for undocumented brothers and sisters, no insurance rate regulation, no drug pricing controls. We still have narrow networks, high co-pays and deductibles, administrative waste, an overall inefficient system and a lack of health security with job loss. So think of all these things. And when somebody pushes a public option and see which of these does a public option really address. So 
one thing I will say is the public option during the uh, presidential election was gaining support that a majority of people seem to support a public option more than Medicare for all. And uh, President Biden's plan um, was basically to create a government run health insurance option. Uh, he's expanded the Obamacare tax credits, given more generous subsidies. You know, essentially, he's he's given everyone more money to go buy a product from a for a pro, from a, from a for profit industry that only makes money by denying care. That's a pretty pretty sham uh, of a subsidy. But here are the key uh, uh, features: government administered. It still re re retains the multifaceted aspects of our healthcare system. All of the payers. Uh, it enhances premium and cost sharing subsidies through the ACA. Uh, he's planning to make anyone that's in a red state where a governor refuses to expand Medicaid to automatically enroll them in a public option. So let's look at 1965. I was born four weeks before Medicare was signed into law. Uh, and just the fact that Medicare prior, despite the fact of taking care of older, sicker patients with more chronic conditions and more medications, it still does a far better job of controlling costs compared to Medicare, I mean, compared to the private insurance industry. And yet Medicare is not allowed to negotiate drug prices or uh, prescription uh, uh, bulk medical supply discounts. So I would argue, and I think we all argue that instead of this convoluted multi-payer system, it would be more simple if we just had a single payer. Sorry. So um, one of the things you'll hear is that the, um, a, um, a Medicare for all plan will cost so much. So this was when Bernie's bill was initially introduced. Uh, Fox and Friends went crazy and they said it would cost $32.6 trillion. But yet when they did this poll on Fox and Friends, they, uh, three quarters of all the uh, respondents said that they would actually still be in favor of it. But what was so disingenuous, not only from the Republican side, but also from the corporate Democratic side, is that the study that was done by the Mercatus Institute showed that yes, um, uh, Bernie's bill would cost $32 you know, trillion. But compared to the status quo, if we did nothing, that would actually cost $2 trillion more, whereas Bernie's bill would insure everyone and also give everyone better benefits than what they had. So by every metric, any this is even a very conservative think tank, every study has shown that a Medicare for all plan would actually save us money. Uh, but this was something that was put out by the Partnership for American Health Healthcare Future that a public option, the one that Biden uh, is proposing would cost $700 billion over the next 10 years. So unlike a Medicare for all system that would save us 2 trillion over 10 years, this is gonna cost us 700 billion and make our system even more complicated and complex. So here's the big differences between a Medicare system and a public option. Uh, as we all know, Medicare for all would cover everyone. Uh, public option would exclude our undocumented brothers and sisters. Medicare would not be tied to employment where the public option still maintains the employer sponsored health care. Medicare for all would eliminate co-pays and deductibles. It would eliminate narrow networks. Um, it would reduce federal spending while ensuring everyone, whereas a public option you can see would cost 700 billion more over 10 years, maintain all the narrow networks. Uh, and it would also still have the administrative waste where a Medicare for all system would not. And we would be able to negotiate drug discounts for a Medicare for all system Whereas a public option, even if some of the private insurers do negotiate drug discounts, they don't pass it on to their uh, enrollees. Um, and just to, it's now been five years since I made my fateful speech in New York um, and where I use this um, uh, insensitive term to refer to legislators that are bought and owned by the private insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry. But just to show you what's happened since I gave that talk, is to show you that of the 130 Democrats who are not backing Medicare for all, they've received $43 million from the pharma and insurance industry during this period of time. And then uh, you would think that the Partnership for America's Healthcare Future would be happy that they defeated Medicare for all, but no, these greedy bastards wanna keep uh, everybody down and now they're trying to oppose the public option. And they're all made up of former uh, Clinton aides and uh, Democratic congressional aides. So um, this is this is what I meant. So uh, for any of you that were offended by the term, I'm, I apologize for that. But I do believe you all should be more offended by these people that claim to be on our side. 
Uh, and they said that within 24 hours of launch of the industry's new ads, uh, this was during the uh, Democratic National Convention, um, Democratic congressional uh, sources were telling the Hill that Democrats were most likely going to table the public option. Have you guys heard anything about it since Biden's taken office? So, so this is where we are, that all that we were told we were going to get, um, already we have forces that are influencing our Democratic House so that they're never going to even bring this up. Um, so finally, I'm just going to say that, um, you know, Shirley Chisholm is somebody that's near and dear to my family. She said, we have never seen health as a right. It has been conceived as a privilege available only to those who can afford it. This is the real reason the American healthcare system is in such a scandalous state. And she ran under the mantra of being unbought and unbossed. And we have far too many legislators in Sacramento, in Los Angeles, in, uh, in our country that are bought and bossed. And I think one of the things that I love about you all is you're holding all of these people to the fire and you are starting to instill some real uh, discomfort in them. I would argue that some of the legislators that signed on to AB 1400, uh, the only reason they signed on were they were worried that they were gonna get primaried by somebody who really was uh, in favor of that. If you look at um, you know, Javanka Beckles, uh, her district, right? She was somebody who was a staunch single payer supporter um, and Wendy Correa's district, you know, uh, these are people that you would never have seen be traditional allies for our bill. And I would argue that that's only the only way we're going to move people is the fear of being voted out. So I just would say that anyone who claims that a public option is a good idea, either they really don't know what they're saying, or they truly are not the real allies of the single payer movement that we think they are. And I think it's important for you all to learn and spread the facts about why a public option is not. I, I would say all of you probably do know this, but I do think it's very important that you all continue to um, spread the, the word on, on why a Medicare for all system, it makes the most sense, why a single payer system here in the state of California makes the most sense and really hold people accountable when they make statements that are simply not rooted in fact. Uh, so with that, I just wanna say thank you so much. And I will, send these slides to uh, Erica and Betty and let them share it and you can share them and use them however you would like. Thank you so much, Dr. Sung, um, for all the great work you do for coming on here tonight and giving this presentation. It's so important. I, you know, as an activist, I get so frustrated with, um, with those in power using public option and single payer interchangeably. Um, the cynical side of me feels that they're co-opting the language and doing it uh, purposefully. And, um, and then there's a part of me that says, well, maybe they just need to come here and listen to Dr. Paul Song. So of course, you know, I invited all of the state of California to attend tonight. Um, and I just so appreciate um, the way you you speak truth and stand in truth and um just big fans of course so um with that we're going to open it up to question and answer if you're okay with that um and gina do we have any questions from facebook if you're on facebook go ahead and type your question into the uh comments and Gina Harris, if you want to wave your hand, Gina. Gina is our Facebook moderator. She will ask your questions. And if you are on Zoom, you can drop your question into the chat or to me, Erica, and I will ask your questions on Zoom. So Gina, any questions? Uh, yeah, actually, there is a question from um, from Facebook from Chris Shimizu, um, and I think I may have uh, also prompted this question bragging about Costa Rica, where I just came from, um, because they have universal health care. Go figure. They don't have a military, but they have universal health care. What about that? Um, and so what I realized about their system when I looked into it was that they have a public system uh, for the coast citizens of Costa Rica with a private option, which seems to be the opposite of what is being promoted here in the US. And 
historically, actually Costa Rica's healthcare system was actually better than ours, but I'm not going to go down there. So Chris is asking, um, she just wants to know uh, the Costa Rica healthcare system versus the public option that moderate de Dems keep proposing. Um, and I and Dr. Song, I don't know, you know, how much you know about the Costa Rica healthcare system, but it is universal health care. And so maybe if you could elaborate the difference between the universal health care systems versus the public option, um, which I think you did also did a good job. There was a slide you had that had showed, you know, kind of some differences there too. So um Thanks for the question. I, you know, I, I don't really, in all honesty, know much about Costa Rica system, so I'm happy to defer to you on that. It's because uh, they're so chill. Costa Rica just stays off the map. Like, they just are chill, and I'm like, I love it. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think that you are seeing some countries that are trying to move towards some privatization. You're starting to see people try to do that in Canada and even parts of the UK, where they would give some basic coverage and then allow uh, private insurance to come in to provide supplemental or to provide for uh, things that are not covered. So Canada doesn't all prescribe, um, they don't uh, cover a lot of tests and things of that nature, blood tests and stuff. So some people buy supplemental insurance for that. Um, I think the, the point is that we just need some real basic strong coverage that all of us can use at any time and not fear of being denied care or not having access to care. Uh, and so I, when I talk to more my more moderate um, friends, I'll say that, okay, so show me a solution where you think that that's working. Um, I, I have no problems with uh, uh, right now, like my mom who's on Medicare is a supplemental insurance, but I do believe that if we can use the, the bargaining power of the collective Medicare, like if all the seniors right now, like Bernie wants to do, use that to negotiate drug prices, better drug prices, better rates at hospitals and things of that nature, that we could use that money to uh, give all these seniors dental, vision, hearing aids at the same time, maybe reduce their 20% to 10%, right? Right now, uh, Medicare Part B, when my mom uh, goes to anything outpatient, uh, they'll cover 80% and then my mom has to find a way to cover them remaining 20%. If we could find, um, you know, when Kaiser or United Healthcare uses its market share to negotiate discounts from Cedars or UCLA or um, Pfizer for drugs, uh, they use that money to pad their uh, bottom line and enrich shareholders. Well, why can't Medicare use that to bring, uh, raise the benefits for all of our seniors or maybe even bring more people into the fold? So, um, you know, I think when, when, when you hear politicians say they want universal health care and they don't ever want to use the Medicare for all or single payer, they want to use, they're, they're bought by the insurance industry. So that's, yeah, that's what my cynical side, they're just co-opting the language. <laughs> um, okay, we have a question for Maureen. Um, we are hearing that unions are not in support of AB 1400. So um, AB 1400 is the Guaranteed um, uh, for All Health Care Act here in California. It's also known as CalCare. Um, and so um, we are hearing that it says unions, I would say not all unions, because there's some unions, but that some unions are not in support of AB 1400. What is a good way to get them on board? What do we tell them? Thank you, Maureen. So um, one thing I'll just say this, and I don't have the inner workings to the unions. Uh, I used to be in close communication with a lot of them when I ran the Courage campaign, but after I left, I really haven't had the conversations with the, the labor unions like I used to before. Uh, I, I really wonder if some of the opposition to AB 1400 comes from unions that a majority of their employees are at Kaiser. And if all of a sudden you eliminate Kaiser uh, ability to you know sit on billions of dollars of reserves does that further reduce their negotiations in terms of wages and things i that i don't know but i i have to wonder if some of the opposition comes from that i what i would say to all labor unions is look at your wages over the last 15 years and then look at how much you've been asked to contribute towards your health care uh, many of them have, uh, you know, these Cadillac plans that are somewhat self-administered. How much have they had to contribute towards their health care? And as a result, how uh, stagnant have their wages been? And wouldn't it be much easier for them to 
not have to deal with labor negotiation strife, which I think is healthcare costs are usually the biggest reason for labor negotiation strife. But, you know, again, not being part of a union, not having real privy, I can't really speak to why they're all opposing. But I do think that with regard to AB 1400, I often wonder that the unions that are affiliated with Kaiser, if there's something there that that we just don't know. Um, Gina, do we have, um, sorry, Maureen, so does that answer your question? I would actually love to hear Maureen's take on this. Oh, my take on it. Um, well, in, specifically in terms of AB 1400, I think we're looking at, um, we have to look at the relationships of unions um, over the last, I would say, 12 years. And for instance, one of the lead unions that should be on board, National Union of Healthcare Workers, um, yes, they have a lot of members that uh, work for Kaiser, but they have also had um, huge legal, they've had legal battles with SEIU and with CNA over the last 12 years. And I think that um, some of the, that um, kind of union uh, competition or union um, warfare really has affected um, the, um, int the uh, interest that union leadership, especially from NUHW, has in um, supporting a bill that is written by CNA. So it's not always just about the bill. There's also a context, I think, that's larger than what we're looking at. Um, so that's one of my concerns. And yes, um, a lot of workers working at Kaiser, but what's crazy is that isn't gonna remove uh, the providers or the workers from Kaiser, the, the healthcare workers, it's gonna remove the administrators. I mean, it, um, AB 1400 is not going to squash Kaiser. It's going to remove the insurance department of Kaiser. Now, Kaiser made $4.5 billion profit last year in COVID, during COVID. And this year, they've already made $2 billion in the first quarter profit. That's what's going to disappear. That profit is going to disappear. And that profit, that money will go back into the delivery of care. In addition, um, you know, we have hospitals closing up and down the state, uh, all over the country. Uh, we have departments being shuttered in various facilities. And this would be an assist to Kaiser because Kaiser and all um, uh, hospitals really, that money would start flowing into the system rather than being extracted away from the system. And if we, if everyone had access to healthcare, we would employ more people. We would open clinics. We would reopen hospitals. We would take care of rural areas and urban areas that are now really struggling um, with, with these closures and with these bankruptcies due to the, due to the um, caste system that we have, the medical apartheid where we have, you know, bargain basement care for the poor and penthouse care for the rich, as, as you showed us in your slides with Cedars and UCLA and Drew. Um, so, you know, it makes no sense to me that uh, unions that employ healthcare workers, they should be, you know, front and center supporting this bill. Um, and people who are concerned about keeping Kaiser healthy and thriving they should be front and center supporting this bill because we're talking about an investment in providers and an investment in facilities and investment in hospitals rather than extraction. So I really don't, when I look at the facts of AB 1400, I don't see any reason for the opposition. Um, when I stand back and look at 12 years of say lawsuit, CNA took NUHW to court in 2015. Um, that might have something to do with it, I don't know. But there has been um, on and off really bad relationships among the, the three major healthcare unions, SEIU, um, NUHW, and CNA. And SEIU took NUHW to court in um, an arbitrate, I mean, sorry, a uh, appeals court in, 2000, in 2013 and NUHW was fined, the leadership was fined a million and a half dollars, um, uh, a federal judge found them guilty of a, a variety of uh, violations. Thank so, you. 
So but, there, uh, there's so that, I, that issue. There's that I, issue. I think this would be a great thing for you all to try to have a, a, a special symposium on it because I remember during Prop 45 and we were trying to get support for insurance rate regulation here in the state that there were some unions, not the three that you mentioned, but some very powerful unions that came out and voted against it. And when I looked at their membership, majority of their membership were frontline workers who weren't getting health, great health insurance from their employers or had to fight for it. And yet they were against it. And then I, when I looked at, there's this inner, somebody sent me this link of like um, Kaiser partners, right? Where they would get certain big organizations to be a partner organization and they were listed there. And I'm like, this is, this is what the, the complexity that they've all got their own separate vested side interests that are they're willing to throw their own members uh you know to aside and 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 it'd be nice to be able to get former leaders of unions so now that they're no longer running these unions and they are not uh beholden to you know towing a company line to be able to come and speak frankly what it what is it what's going on behind there and i would love if you guys could put a program like that because that we need to know this as an organization. Why are so many, uh, why is there this, this disconnect with many uh, labor unions? Thank you so I, I much. You, and I hope, oh, Marianne, I, was say, I'm gonna... I think you summed it up. You summed it up in that leadership does not always represent membership. Right. And that's a problem in all organizations. Yep. Yes, exactly. I was thinking the same thing, just like we see here in the Democratic Party. Um, leadership is not the same as as the base, as the people. Um, Gina, you have a question in Facebook and then I have one in. Uh, Zoom. Yeah, this I, and this is honestly one. I uh, haven't seen any more questions pop up, but um, it's just from Lynn. Um, and I am not going to butcher your last name, Lynn. But she is asking, um, can you repeat why Wendy Carrillo switched and had removed her name as a co-author of AB 1400? Um, her name still appears on the CalCare handouts. Again, I, I, maybe she, she saw that Ron Birnbaum was not going to primary her. I don't know. But <laughs> I still hold hope that Ron will. But I, again, I think the fear of the, our movement. So I don't think within the halls of Sacramento, we have the, the real champions that we need. We certainly didn't see it during 562 when, um, you know, the senators who sponsored it then abandoned it, right? So, uh, but I think our movement is stronger than it's ever been. It uh, scares people, um, it frightens people. And I think if you look at some of these districts uh, that maybe the person elected doesn't re re uh, reflect the real progressive nature of their district and somehow they got elected through uh, other things, they they felt obliged to quote co-sponsored it. Uh, but then when push comes to shove, their name wasn't on the final uh, bill. So I, I think that's one of the things we need to do. We need to elect. So you see Dave Jones is running, right? He's going to, uh, whereas he's always been unabashedly for single payer. Uh, and, and, uh, and he, you know, Richard Pan has termed out who's never been a champion of single payer, despite, he, you know, he's a doctor and he's been much more aligned with uh, the CMA um, uh, stance, but you know we get people. We need to get more and more people like that in and scare others to vote because if they don't, they're going to get voted out. So I just want to say that the um, author of AB fourteen hundred, Assemblymember Ashkara, just joined us on the Zoom. Um, thank you, Assemblyman, for joining. Um, uh, Dr. Song was just saying. Uh, why he thought some, uh, the, some of those in public office who didn't support uh, single payer before were, was supporting it now because um, it's, it's popular and they don't want to get primaried. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's part of it. And part of it is that, you know, the, 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 as public, you know, as time moves on, there's different public perceptions on a lot of things. We've seen it when it comes to marriage equality. We've seen it on so many issues where, at one moment, even you know, you go back to the mid, the mid, you know, the 2000, 2005, 2006. At that time, most Democrats were either uncertain where they were on marriage equality, or they were opposed, and you've got a marriage between a man and a woman. And then, in a handful of years later, you saw almost every Democrat was all of a sudden for marriage equality, right? I mean, I think that things happen at certain times, when, but but it happens usually because momentum is built from the ground up. When, the, when, when there's, when you do polling 
and see nationally on single pair that is so overwhelmingly popular. Well, that may not have been the case 15 years ago. It probably was still more popular, but it's definitely moved. And I think the elected, the electorate, the elected officials will represent that in two ways, in genuinely moving their position or doing it pragmatically. Either way, it gives it puts us in a better position um, than we may have been previously. Uh, and I do, I, I was actually, um, I was just driving back to my place and I was listening in on the uh, the conversation as I was walking up the steps. And I wanted to um, add some, if, if anybody wants to hear, on Wendy Carrillo. Somebody asked specifically about Wendy. And so this is what happened. This is kind of the inside baseball of what happens when you're trying to rush to get something um, put across the desk. And so when it came to um, um, filing AB 1400, um, we found out for certain, just literally for less than a handful of days um, before the deadline to submit a bill um, that because it was going to require a suburb analysis, that if it didn't get in by that particular Friday, the last day for to introduce, because originally we were planning, when I say we, nurses and myself were thinking, okay, well, that's, you know, we, we can always, um, you know, just put a spot bill and then maybe let's do it on our own time in terms of pacing ourselves. What happened was once we lear learned that it wouldn't be heard at all, unless it got in in time for the suburb analysis, then we had to rush literally in a matter of a couple of days, not only to get the language we wanted in, in uh, and there's still some improvements we could do on that, but I think it was pretty good language. Um, but uh, we also had to quickly try to get as many co-authors as we could. Uh, and Wendy literally, I mean, I remember it because it's not just 1400, everybody's scrambling on their bills with language. And so everyone's super busy those last couple of days. And um, Wendy got back to be the co-author, but it literally was like a handful, like five, 10 minutes after we had already passed the bill across the desk. So, you know, that's why we put her in the press release, which is on the fact sheet, because she's the, the first opportunity we get to amend it, you know, she's there as a co-author. So she was very clear about that. And, and she's never wavered from her position of being fully supportive. And so um, if she had, if that weren't the case, then I wouldn't be putting her on the press releases and putting her on the fact sheet. So that's in, in that one case, that's what happened uh, with Wendy. It was just a timing issue. We And that happens sometimes. It's happened to me as well, where I try to jump in on someone to be a co-author and I miss it. And I'm I, what I tell them is, okay, well, the next opportunity you get, please add me. And that's where, that's what happened. Thank you, Assembly Member, for that inside baseball. <laughs> um, and really quickly of you know, the authors we've had for single payer bills in California, you are standing out as the most dedicated and the most hardworking. And um, we so appreciate you. We have a couple of questions that I want to get to. I'm going to ask Stacy's question and then I'm going to ask Aja Mumakalani's question. So Stacy Ludwig asked, we are post pandemic with high loss of employment and a public health crisis, and we still do not see a policy window for healthcare reform. How do you see actually moving universal healthcare forward? How do we create the policy window? Well, well, first of all, I also want to thank, you know, Dr. Song for not just being here, but he's been the champion advocating for single bear for so many, you know, for, for your career, I mean, as long as I've known you. So I appreciate you. And Erica, thank you also for always inviting me to these conversations. I appreciate it. I'll just say, look, you know, at the end of the day, if COVID is an exam, if COVID doesn't tell all of us we need single pair, I don't know what will. So that, so if someone still doesn't support it, even after what we've seen this past year, then they're, they're likely never going to support it. But, I, but, but it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean we don't push folks. And so at the end of the day, whether we have a good economy or a bad, there's always going to be a reason not to do something. Oh, the economy is going really, really well. Let's not disrupt it. Or, oh, the economy is going really bad. And right now, let's just make sure people don't lose health insurance. Let's not focus on doing something too bold. So there's always going to be, I can make a justification as to why we shouldn't do single pair at any, any moment. And so let's remember that when folks push back uh, on, on doing it, saying this is not the right time, but they, but they generally mean it's never the right time. And so we've got to convince enough folks that this is the right time. And I think that we have the best window to do it because of the COVID crisis, because we've seen what hap was happened with Black and Latino life expectancy, because they were more likely to succumb to COVID. We've seen a, dram a dramatic drop. That's not just because of COVID. 
it's because of the underlying conditions that they were more likely to have because of our healthcare system. And so we've got to sell it to everyone. And what I've told folks um, in, in these weeks and months ahead is we've got to grow the movement of organizations, individuals. And, I, and I've, I've got to say this before I forget, and I, I texted this to Erica earlier. I was very excited to hear that this morning at um, the, the, the Labor Federation had their annual legislative conference, usually in person, but of course now it's on Zoom. And this morning, um, the head of the building trades, Robbie Hunter, actually made a very persuasive, persuasive strong pitch as to why we need to do single pair. That's never happened before. Yeah, and I will say, Rob, Robbie, Robbie has been, um, he's a force, and that's what I meant. There's, there are other units that are quite powerful. I just want to say one thing to uh, Assembly Member Calra. I mean, thank you for not only doing this, but You've really been the progressive uh, voice in, in in the assembly. So we we support you on so many things, not just uh, single payer. One thing I would ask, though, is you just saw the government governor announce this big surplus and he's plowing money and all sorts of things. And, um, you know, I just showed how Medi-Cal in our state is separate and unequal, how the waiting times and the networks are so low and the privatization is there some way that you could at least increase reimbursement to allow more doctors to take it so then that we'd have more access to care? Uh, I mean, that's not going to get single payer, but at least, but the fact that the governor didn't do anything meaningful for health care when you now have more people on Medi-Cal because they lost their jobs yeah. through the pandemic, I, I, I just, I'm, it's really disappointing. No, I mean, look, I, I, I agree. I mean, we, we, the last, every time we have an opportunity to, to increase Medi-Cal reimbursements, I've supported it. We, we did it a couple of years back, I think, or three years ago. Uh, I think we need to do more. I, I, I do think that, um, and I know you were speaking to this earlier as I was um, tuning in and out, um, that Medi-Cal reimbursements are, are still feeding into an unequal system or a, a profiteering system. But I will say this. Some things that we are doing, including expanding Medi-Cal to more of our undocumented community. I think we should cover every undocumented resident in California. But every time we do that, um, it, as you know, and, I, and I, I, I'm, you know, the folks that I see here, I imagine know as well, it makes the case for single payer even stronger. It makes it, 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 it lowers our cost because we're, or at least how much more we have to pay in because part of the argument is it's gonna cost X amount of money. Well, the more we expand Medi-Cal, that's more money we were already putting into an inefficient system. And I liken that to what's happening at the federal level, which is at the federal level, if they if they um, expand, for example, they put money into long-term care, or they expand Medicare to add dental and vision, or they lower the age five years. Those are all phenomenal things for CalCare because that reduces our cost to make CalCare a reality. And so um, all these things are good things. And I agree 100%, Paul, that there's more that we should do. As you know, that there's been a lot of advocates that have, have been disappointed that, we, that not enough has been put into public health, for example, and public health right. departments. After what we saw this last year, of all things, you would imagine that that's where we should be pumping in. A whole lot of money is public health and public health departments that picked up the slack or at least tried to try to tread water during the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And they're the ones that ultimately are gonna keep people healthy in, during, you know, quote, normal times as well. But I agree, I, I think we have to do more for medical, especially in underserved communities. And that's why CalCare accounts for that um, in, in terms of underserved communities and rural communities. Because I'm going to jump that. in here because we've got time. But yes, and obviously passing CalCare um, gives everybody health care and lowers costs. So we could just skip and just pass <laughs> AB 1400 and get it done. Ajamu uh, Makalani, you had your hand raised. Yeah, this is for uh, Ash. You said all the right things and it's very liberal and progressive on one point. So let me try to preface, let me try to, this is kind of like sort of leading into my question here. One is that healthcare in this country is over a billion dollars. Then California is the largest market for healthcare insurance companies. These companies are profit driven companies. They will not relinquish healthcare to single pair without a fight because of the enormous profits that, 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 that are being made. So we must be clear to understand these social forces that, that, in, that we're interacting with. Secondly, healthcare at its core, single payer at its core is a working class issue. Yep. 
these healthcare companies give money to politicians in so many ways. These corporations funnel money to politicians. Now, I'm going to ask you something, Ash. Can you say right now that you will not take campaign money from corporations, whether they are healthcare companies or corporations, from the 1%? Can you say that now? Well, I will tell you that out of 120 legislators, I'm one of only two that does not take corporate PAC money. Okay, so you you are saying literally now that you will not take money from from corporations from PAC money coming from the one percent. Is that clear? Are we clear? I I've already pledged not to. Okay, all right. Because see, outside of that ass, everything else is just talk, and we're we're really getting fed up that the liberal politicians give the say the right things, but at the same time too taking money from the one percent. All right. Um, I, 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 I agree. Yeah, Can sorry, Paul. About, you know, like, I think if you look at Ash's words and actions, he is definitely not bought. Uh, and I admire and respect him for that. One thing I'll just say with regard to Medi-Cal, if you are really trying to expand and include more of our undocumented brothers and sisters, which I'm in favor of, if you do not also increase the reimbursement and, and bring in the, and, and have more scrutiny over the private management companies, then you're basically going to just put more people into a system and not bring in any more doctors or providers mm -hmm. in, and it's gonna further delay their access to care. So they, it, it isn't just put giving more people a Medicaid card, because if you don't, we're 47th out of 50 states in terms of reimbursement. If we don't get the reimbursement that, that they need, and Ron and I, uh, Dr. Birnbaum and I have always taken Medi-Cal patients, but, but uh, there are a lot of specialists, we can't get other doctors to see them. And you're gonna put in a whole nother you know, remember one out of three people in the state of California is on Medi-Cal. You add now every undocumented brother and sister and mother and father, now you've put in another, um, you know, two or three percent. Uh, but if you're not getting reimbursement, you're just putting thousands of people into it and with, with even less access to care. So I think I would yeah. really ask you all to, to really pay attention to that. But, but hold on, but Paul, I'm not quite sure what you're saying because see, what I'm hearing is Band-Aid, this type of Band-Aid type solution here. Are we going to move towards a universal health care for every man and woman to access like Cuba to go see a doctor and provide health care? Or, or will we be talking about Band-Aids? I'm not, I'm moving this, I would like to move this conversation beyond uh, Medi-Cal and, and so on, because when you hear those words, that tends to already denote a type of uh, uh, inferior in quality health care. Can we move this? I'm not talking about Medicare or Medi-Cal. I'm talking about a strict universal program that every man and woman, working class person can see health care. This is a working class issue, and we must begin to ground our conversation, our dialogue within the context of a working class dialogue. Ajumu, this is what... Um AB 1400 is CalCare. It is single payer. I am so glad you are here tonight. Thanks. We want you on the leadership team with us. Um, I, I'll drop my cell phone to contact you. Um, this Sounds is a good. beautiful way to close this out because in the end, um, as Ajumu said, we don't need Band-Aids. We need the whole thing. We need single payer. We have a bill, AB 1400. CalCare, um, it saves lives and it saves money. So with that, we are gonna end the speaker's portion. Um, and we do have a little treat, um, doing something different tonight. So um, this is where you can um, unplug your headsets, I'll unplug mine. Um, and we're going to um, have Jeannie Simpson um, close out our event tonight with a little CalCare mindful movement. Um, Jeannie Simpson is an actor, dancer, choreographer, teacher, and fitness blogger. Um, her choreography credits include shows for Theater Works USA, co-choreographer and dance captain for three uh, directed by Hal Prince at the Amundsen Theater in Los Angeles, the children's TV show Blues Clues for Nickelodeon, and the feature films Man of the Century and Dumped. Favorite acting credits include Wishbone, Mad Men, Parks and Recreation, saw you on that, Jamie, Hot in Cleveland, and How to Get Away with Murder. Um, she currently teaches 
Decade Dance Party, and we're going to drop the link um, so that if you are interested in getting your dance on, um, you can do that. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie. Right. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Um, Song, for that incredible presentation. Thank you, everyone who's here for being a champion for healthcare for all. You inspire me, and uh, I am so grateful for the work that you do every day, and I know how incredibly hard it is. So right now, when I teach my dance classes for kids, grown-ups, I always end by putting something good in the universe, and this is what we do. We look up and we picture something we want to put into the universe. And usually I have no idea what people are picturing. You know, <laughs> I don't want to know. No. Uh, but tonight we are all going to picture the same thing. We're going to harness the collective power of thought and movement. And we're going to put the same thing into the universe together. And we're going to try to put a little bit of magic in the air for Cal care and healthcare for all nationally and for California. So here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna show you the movements, like 10 seconds worth of movement, tell you what it means. Then I'm gonna put on a little music and we're just gonna do it together. You can do it seated, you can stand up, you can turn off your screen, no one's looking, don't worry. <laughs> this is just, this is for you. This is for you and for the principles of Cal Care and healthcare for all that we all believe in. So here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna look up and we're gonna see a very heavy box on a shelf. We're going to reach up and we're going to get that box and bring it down right here. Yes. And then we're going to look inside that box. And guess what? This is what is inside the box. There is universal coverage for everyone, everyone. A single public program, not an option, a program is right there in the box. It's there. Fully comprehensive benefits for everyone. I don't care who you are. There are your benefits. Freedom to choose your own provider is there. It's right there. The freedom to get care, free care at the point of service is right there. The, the just transition is sitting right there to help the people who were in the insurance business before we made it so much better. And last but not least, the most important thing to me is patient care based on patient need whoever you are, whoever that patient is. So I want you to see all of that in this box. No wonder it was so heavy. And then I want you to give it to yourself like you're washing your face in it. And I want you to rock it like a baby. And then you're gonna give one arm and then you're gonna get a little braver and you're gonna give another arm of it away. And then you're gonna give two arms and then you're gonna throw it in the air just like confetti. All right, throw it up. And then we'll come back here for a little gratitude hands on your heart, and that's it. And we'll say goodbye. So let's try this with music. This is a song called World from Five for Fighting about making the world a better place. Follow me. Here we go. All right, there it is. Go get it. Bring it down. Really see it. There it is. See all of it. Give it to yourself first. And rock it like a baby. Give one arm. One more. All right, get brave. Two arms. Open yourself up. Reach down and throw it in the air. That's it. Good. Right here. Gratitude for our time together. Hands on your heart, close your eyes. This is just for you, whatever you need, a moment for yourself. We're all champions. You work so hard. Give yourself some love. Good. Right here. One more time. That's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work, and thank you for letting me come and visit. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, Dr. Sung. Thank you, Assembly Member Kara. Um, thank you. All, I'm looking at all your faces, all of our Healthcare for All Los Angeles team members, all the work you did to put tonight on, to put every day on. Um, and thank you, all of you, for joining us on Facebook. A couple of things, our next speaker series, you can put it in your calendar. It's June 28th. 
uh, same time, 7.30 p.m. on Facebook Live, but also every Sunday um, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., we have Cal Care office hours. I'm looking at Dr. Ron Birnbaum, if you wanna wave. He is the MD that is in the house for Cal Care office hours. And we have Gina Har Harris, um, she was our Facebook moderator tonight. She is the RN that is usually in the house for CalCare office hours. We also have different speakers, different doctors attend. Um, Dr. Song would love to have you come to a CalCare office hours. So you can join us on Facebook Live every Sunday uh, between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. for CalCare office hours. Um, finally, if you liked what you saw tonight, um, put five on it. Um, go to bit.ly, H-C-A-L-A, donate, um, or you can visit our website, H-C-A-L-A.org. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone.